All right, live from the city that invented pizza and hamburgers or something like that. Um, it seems like kind of an extravagant claim somehow, but we know they, that you invented hamburgers. For sure. For, yeah, for sure. But there's like something else that you could say about the pizza. Like, I don't know exactly what. Uh, anyway, we're here in New Haven. We're at the beautiful Gateway Community College, which is our new New Haven home as of this week. I'm Colin McEnroe. This is the Colin McEnroe Show. This is WNPR. But you know all that. Why else? Well, you might be just driving along 95 going... What's this? Uh, <laughs> in which case, that's what this is. Uh, and this is something we call the nose. We usually do it on Fridays, but for reasons that would take forever to recreate, we are doing it on Wednesday. Um, and we are lucky to have with us some of our favorite uh, New Haven nose panelists. Uh, to my immediate right is Tom Breen. I don't know why, I'm just saying there's a live audience here. That's why I'm saying like where he's sitting, which I know to you in Radio Land is meaningless. But Tom <laughs> Breen is a film critic and reporter for the New Haven Independent and the host of WNHH Radio's Deep Focus. <laughs> I'm the only person who says it that way. But um, Mercy Quay uh, is a founder and executive director of the Narrative Project and the host of WNHH's See, there's kind of a little pattern developing here. Work it out. No, I really wouldn't say it that way. How would I say it? How, how would I say work it out to give it the proper jaunty work fit? Work it out. Oh, oh, I like that. <laughs> I don't even think I could do that. I'm not, I'm not even cool enough to say the name of your show. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> Think about where that leaves me. Uh, Pedro mm -hmm. Soto is an account executive at DRT Power Systems in, in New Haven and will soon be hosting on WNHHs. <laughs> you should be hosting some kind of real geeky Star Wars. Sure. Just, like, uh, I don't know. Why has that already happened? I don't know. <laughs> oh, well, maybe. Talk, we'll, as he points to the Yeah. <laughs> well, the other, the other radio uh, station here in New Haven. Yeah. yeah. I, I would love to do that. So I, I feel like that if could If anyone happen. wants to, to do it with me, just let yeah. me know. Yeah. Lu well, Lucy Gelman sit here in the audience. I think she has a lot of decision making power there. Can we just like <laughs> green light that right now? I need to call back and see what I All right. That's <laughs> good. Um, <laughs> Because look, if they can get Cloverfield on Netflix, it must be easy to green light stuff. Um, <laughs> I, I should just go for Netflix right. instead. Of she should go straight to Netflix, yeah. We're, but we're getting ahead of ourselves. We're going to tell you a little bit about what we'll talk about today. We are going to have a casual conversation first about the uh, portraits of both President uh, Obama and Michelle Obama, the former First Lady, uh, and then about the fascinating transition, assuming that it's even a transition. <laughs> <laughs> for Omarosa. I feel like Omarosa has just been in the same place and the world has kind of slightly <laughs> revolved around her changing things, but I don't really feel like Omarosa has moved very much. And then in our final uh, discussion segment, we will talk about the Cloverfield paradox uh, and I don't know, just get ready for some real excitement about that. Um, but we will begin with um, this, uh, these really, well, I, actually, people are saying they're really unusual portraits. I'm not entirely convinced that's the case. But they certainly are portraits that have occasioned a, a lot of discussion these days. Uh, of course, Twitter has taken the place of art criticism uh, in a and it has taken the place of everything else, too. So I don't know. I, I don't know where exactly to start the conversation. I know what I think about them. But Tom, I mean, just give me your basic reaction to these two uh, portraits of our former first family. Sure. So it's, it's almost difficult for me to talk about these portraits, especially the one of Barack Obama, without choking up a little. And that's not something that happens too often uh, when I look at paintings or look at art. I mean, I spent, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about art, but something about looking at the Kahinda Wiley portrait of Barack Obama in particular uh, really evokes something <laughs> that's difficult to articulate. It, it's what I've boiled down to, it is an unresound, I mean it's a resounding kind of unequivocal affirmation that there is beauty in the world. Uh, and especially in the context of such kind of nefariously ugly political times in which we currently live, I find a lot of solace uh, and hope and idealism and patience and sensitivity in that portrait of, of President Obama. Um, and in th I find the Michelle Obama one, I think it will probably last as the more, um, uh, perhaps the more controversial portrait, but also the more durable one. I think that it says maybe a lot less about the individual of Michelle Obama and more about the idea of a very strong black woman uh, kind of embracing the necessary humility uh, to make an impact from uh, you know, the first kind of black White House. Uh, I, I find it a very powerful picture, but one that's a little bit more difficult to penetrate. Yeah, and I think it is also worthwhile to s 
pull them apart, separate them apart. We can't, we shouldn't be talking about them as one. Um, my descriptive powers are inevitably kind of ham-fisted in these situations, but for those of you who haven't seen the Kehinde Wiley, uh, I should also say I'm required legally to say that Kehinde Wiley uh, had his first exhibit, his first exhibition of his own work in Hartford, Connecticut at Real Artways. Um, his, he shows President Obama sitting amid foliage uh, his feet disappear a little bit into the leaves. He's sitting in a plain wooden chair. Uh, there's a kind of uh, severity to his eyes and a kind of friendliness or playfulness to his mouth. Um, and, and as you say, Tom, the um, portrait uh, of Michelle Obama probably is in some ways more of a departure. Uh, it's by Amy Sherald. Uh, it is, uh, shows her, it's a kind of not exactly, I wouldn't call it uh, photorealistic. It's, uh, it's more of an abstraction of her. She's wearing a dress that evokes both quilting and kind of the geometry of Mondrian. Um, she has a thoughtful gaze. Her skin tone is closer to gray, I would say, than her actual skin tone. And so, I don't know, Mercy, maybe we could start there with the Michelle Obama one, because, I don't know, Kalila Brown-Dean was on with us this morning, and she was saying it wasn't really the portrait she wanted mm -hmm. uh, of Michelle Obama. Well, it's certainly not the portrait I wanted of Michelle Obama. I, so I do have to just uh, echo what Thomas said. It, Barack's, because you know we're on first name basis. <laughs> Barack's <laughs> portrait was great. I mean, it was an emotional portrayal of who I think this president uh, was and is to uh, just the community today. Michelle, on the other hand, um, it, now I understand that the artist has this sort of signature where she paints all of her uh, subjects in grayscale mm -hmm. to uh, effectively erase race from mm -hmm. the, the portrait. Um, but I think that trademark of hers makes the portrait look amateurish. I think it looks like a pencil drawing. Um, and that was when, you, I mean, black Twitter was all over this saying that we got, we got what we wanted from, uh, from Barack's portrait. Thank you, Kehinde Wiley, right? But I'm not certain uh, who this girl is who thinks she knows anything about Michelle. <laughs> and there were, there were, you know, hundreds of different perspectives. Black Twitter went directly to Photoshop to say, uh, to do better renditions of this <laughs> portrait. And... I mean, I, I, I am disappointed. I think mm. it, it, it leaves something to be desired. Mm. I, I think I'm able to defend this portrait, but I want to go to you next, Pedro. And you can pick either, either one of them to talk about. Yeah, I mean, I think the one that um, I probably have the most to say about is, is Obama's portrait. Um, I think that what I really liked about it, um, I sort of said, you know, in our conversation, I kind of felt like the one thing missing was like a big, uh, you know, microphone dropped sort of in the grass. Uh, because I really felt that it was, you know, it, in, you have two choices, I think, with a portrait like this, right? You have, you know, 43 presidents, um, uh, and they're all the same, and they're all in the same thing, and you're the first, uh, you know, black president. What are you going to do? Are you going to have, you know, the old style, but with a black person in it, or are you just going to say, I'm going to make this my own, and I'm going to go uh, to really evoke, I think, the motion, uh, you know, uh, evoke the moment of the last eight years um, and, to, and to do his own thing. And I think that he really managed to do that um, with, with that with that portrait. I think had it, had it been anything more, more traditional, more normal, I think it, 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 we probably wouldn't even be talking about it today. It would have been like, oh, there it is, okay. You know, that check mark on the legacy is done and we can move on. I will do the host's job here of doing a little bit of contextualizing, too, because I think it's easy to say, well, these, both of these portraits represent significant departures. Uh, it's not necessarily true. Uh, there's in, in the Hall of Presidents at the National Portrait Gallery, there is, for example, a really bizarre FDR portrait uh, that it was based on some sketches done at Yalta, but it, it, it includes a fairly conventional portrait of FDR and then five sets of disembodied bodied hands floating below him, hmm. doing things like holding pencils or cigarettes or things like that. His hands are, and apparently it was actually going to be a group portrait at Yalta, and Stalin decided that he didn't want to be in any portrait. No <laughs> portrait. Uh, and stormed off. And this guy, this artist, had among other things, apparently a lot of sketches of FDR's hands. So they just are floating around in hmm. this very weird way in the portrait. Obviously, there's, you know, the Chuck Close uh, portrait of Bill Clinton, which is, you know, hmm. and, and of course the history of that is that that was not the commissioned portrait, uh, the original commission, uh, commissioned portrait. The artist put in and later revealed that he had put in a shadow of the blue dress 
uh, oh, up against yeah. a mantle. And the, when the Clintons found that out, uh, the portrait disappeared rather quickly. And the Chuck Close portrait that's there uh, is um, was on, is on, technically on loan from a private collector. And the other one I would point out is JFK's portrait, which was by Elaine de Kooning. And is you're nodding, yeah, it's not. It's really mm. not like any kind of academy type type of painting. So I mean, there's no reason why our president shouldn't be reflected in lots of different styles. Take yeah, I'm, well, I'm glad you brought up the Elaine de Kooning portrait because I think what so distinguishes that and what so distinguishes uh, the Obama portraits is something obvious, but I think it's very important to say, color. I mean, there's mm -hmm. so much more color, some vibrant color, color uh, from the background in particular of the Barack and Michelle Obama images that, uh, you know, in the way that the best portraits and I think most provocative portraits do communicate something about the kind of internal life and turmoil of the person who is set in front of it. Uh, with the Barack Obama portrait, we have uh, this kind of dense, uh, almost like net of foliage that is ensnaring him uh, as he's sitting in this ornate wooden chair, kind of floating in the middle uh, of these leaves. You have all of these different kind of sprouts of flowers that I understand represent uh, his uh, kind of his lineage. There's a uh, chrysanthemum for representing Chicago, there's a flower for Kenya, a flower for Hawaii. Um, but I think that, uh, you know, what differentiates these portraits for me, again, is it's not just the, the color that kind of splashes in the viewer's face when you look at these, but how relatively uh, small the figures are in these paintings. Any one of the pictures you just spoke about, whether FDRs or JFKs or Bill Clintons, even despite, or no, no matter the innovations or the small little you know, uh, treasures hidden, the, the people dominate the pictures in a way that I don't think that the Obama's kind of representational presences dominate these pictures. It's almost more about what is surrounding and instead or clothing these people uh, than about their faces in particular for Michelle Obama or just <laughs> everything about Barack. Yeah, and Mercy, I find myself wondering um, on behalf of black Twitter, which I often, I often wonder on behalf of black Twitter, <laughs> um, I, I'm just wondering whether anybody is willing to accept the idea that 10 years out, this Michelle Obama portrait actually might look a little different and feel a little different and, and, and might seem like very emblematic of her in the sense that she broke so many molds, she broke another one. Yeah, I mean, I think black Twitter can accept the ab abstraction that you know this portrait ended up being. Um, but I'm happy that you talked in, in sort of this roundabout way about posterity because uh, Michelle said in her speech after the portrait revealed that she wants little black girls to be able to see themselves in this photo. And to that end, right, I, I'm sort of reflecting on that that piece and I'm like, I. I don't see myself in this photo because of the grayscale, right? And that is the point, that is the artist's, uh, uh, that's her trademark, she wants to remove race. And so in the idea of removing race, I don't think that there's this sort of unequivocal right statement that I want this specific race of girls to see themselves in my photo, because that's just not gonna happen. Yeah, I, I don't know, there's a way in which I feel like, um, I've said this this morning on, on, on the wheelhouse, that. What I see in these paintings, too, I mean, there was this sort of generation of African-American artists, the post-war generation that was Romare Bearden and, and Jacob Lawrence and Benny Andrews and painters like that, who combined, you know, sort of academy-born styles with what we sometimes now call outsider art, right? And to me, this looks a little bit like that, too. It's like if you discovered this painting, you know, in some place outside the academy or something, you peep, somebody will go, wow, this is like some amazing outsider art, you know, that's, that's very cool. Let's buy it. And um, I'm thinking like of dentists or something. <laughs> CNN did this uh, did this small clip where they took the photo and they walked around New York to see if anyone could recognize who the woman was. <laughs> well. <laughs> and right, the, appropriately, many people said, I mean, I guess it kind of looks like Michelle Obama, <laughs> but it looks more like Gabrielle Union, <laughs> right? And they were all confused. Well, fortunately, they didn't say it looks like our next topic. We are going to switch topics here <laughs> uh, and, uh, and talk about uh, another African-American woman who's in the news a lot but in a different way. Um, I'm talking, of course, about Omarosa, who went from reality TV uh, to something that looks like reality TV, but is actually the White House, uh, and then back to reality TV. <laughs> She's now uh, on, one of the, on a Celebrity Big Brother show, where, disconcertingly, Pedro, <laughs> she whispers like somebody in a Cloverfield movie when the monster <laughs> is very close. Let's hear a little bit, let's hear A2, Gene, a little bit of that whispering. You know, I'd like to say not my problem, but I can't say that because, like, it's bad. Should we be worried? No. 
don't say that. Because well, we are worried, but I need you to say, no, it's going to be okay. okay. No, it's going to not be okay. It's not. So bad. That's actually two different people talking. That's not uh, Marissa having this golem like oh, conversation yeah. uh, <laughs> with herself. Um, but I, Peter, I don't even know where to start exactly. Uh, I mean, wow. <laughs> Just this is 2018. Um, I mean, the fact, hey, first of all, um, with Omarosa, I mean, I think it's, you know, she, she is a reality star, so she's going to play this up for all it's worth. But, um, you know, I think that what else was she going to do on Celebrity Big Brother but just scare, you know, the heck out of us that all of these things are really true and awful. I mean, it has to be wish fulfillment. That's what reality TV is. So if she was just like, well, it's not so bad, and, you know, some people are really nice and the coffee's good, I mean, I think it would have been, you know, it just people would have been like, what, what, what's she talking about? You know, we're ex this is exactly what we're expecting with. I think, you know, the Tom Wolf book kind of teed it up, and she is just, just taking it all the way to the bank. Um, so I think this has a lot more to say about her and her own sort of personal uh, enrichment and, and what she's, her own personal brand, than I think anything that may have happened in, in real life. Well, I also feel like it's sort of a comment, uh, commentary on how people communicate these days. So I was watching a clip. She was talking to Michael Strahan uh, after she got fired, and she said, when I get my chance, I'm going to have quite a story to tell. Mm -hmm. Now, Mercy, when I, I thought <laughs> she meant like when I can write a book or something. Mm -hmm. I didn't realize when I get my chance means when I'm sitting on a sofa slumped over with some other guy in some dingy celebrity <laughs> big brother like that's that's where you're going to begin telling people how scared you are of president trump i think she's still teasing her book i think even on a celebrity uh, front or celebrity is, big brother is that why she's I, whispering i think she's right exactly so bad <laughs> <laughs> she's been Wait, teasing her book since she was fired and uh, you, again black twitter will not have it <laughs> like, um and back and forth in the email exchange uh, i we were talking about whether amorosa has ever been in the tribe the tribe being you know the tribe of black twitter have we ever accepted her even before black twitter was a thing um and i'm thinking back to 2003 when she made her first appearance on uh apprentice five years later in 2008 right um the root made a listicle of something like 21 black people we want to remove from black history <laughs> <laughs> and omarosa made that list um but i think we feel the same way about her as we do about stacy dash about ben carson these days right you're 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 in the tribe you are in the tribe from birth but you know we're watching you and we've been watching omarosa since 2000 Three, and I, I think we voted her off the island at, at this point. Although, well, I mean, I'm glad you're putting it that way, because Tom, I feel like there's a difference, well, there are several differences between Omarosa and, say, Ben Carson, but what's freaking me out a little bit is the, the kind of general sense of equivalence to all this. I mean, mm -hmm. there are certainly times when President Trump s seems to equate being president of the United States with being on The Apprentice, right? And and I did note that um, at one point when the kind of back and forth barbs were going after her uh, dismissal and ouster from the White House, uh, the Deputy Secretary, Raj Shah, who, who by the way is from Norwalk, um, <laughs> Connecticut boy, gotta be happy about that, Brian McMahon so High School, <laughs> um, <laughs> in briefing the press said, she, he says, she's been fired three times on The Apprentice, and now this is the fourth. <laughs> right. <laughs> right, because of course Celebrity Big Brother is a logical extension of, of whatever reality show uh, is playing out in the White House. I actually would, I, I know that I am you know, very easily uh, manipulated when watching these types of reality shows and, and soaps, and so maybe uh, take this with a grain of salt, but what I found so kind of upsetting watching that uh, breathy revelation on the couch in Big Brother is how how well Omarosa uh, and like accessibly she's able to articulate what a lot of people are terrified by about Trump, not at a political level, but in a sheer kind of emotional and personal level. When she says that she was haunted by tweets or followed by tweets yes. or snuck, snuck up upon by tweets uh, I, and, and is you know weeping about that, yes, I recognize that this is someone who is you know of a similar ilk uh, of Trump in her ruthlessness and, and media savviness, but I found in her ability to, you know, uh, this kind of 
exit interview confession to talk about how what she saw on the inside of the White House is what a lot of us are kind of terrified by and confused by as we watch the, the White House from the outside. Uh, I found a very un unsettling uh, kind of point of connection with Omarosa. It, you know, it, what's very interesting is that sort of everyone who has been um, fired from the Trump White House has inevitably sort of fallen on their own sword and said, well, you know, it was my time, it was really my fault, you know, and she's really the first one who's kind of come out fighting, I think. Um, and so I think that there's really at least something that is different that uh, with, with how she's sort of taking this versus, you know, um, you know, and, you know, Scaramucci or uh, Paul Spicer is really the, the biggest example of someone who was fired and then gave Trump really a big bear hug, you know, that, is, that it was all really his own fault. Well, you know, what I, I do think, I mean, I know, I understand what Tom is saying, which is that she's saying a lot of stuff that, yeah, that we yeah. think. Although I, I, I am maybe more alarmed than anybody else on this stage, but maybe not. By, I mean, what we know about reality television is that people say whatever is needed at that moment, right? They don't say, I mean, when... Omarosa, I know way too much about Omarosa now. I don't feel good about this. <laughs> You're welcome. Like, I thought maybe I would not ever know very much about her, but I, I know. And so when she was fired, I was watching this interview she did with Michael Strahan, and she, she couched it a very different way. She said that she had a 14-year relationship with President Trump. A lot of people around her were threatened by that, were jealous of, of the kind of intimacy that she enjoyed with President Trump, and that that's why she was gone. So, I mean... Mm. Like, Mercy, the fact that she's sitting on a couch whispering now, he's so bad, it's, I would never vote for him again. He's Cloverfield, <laughs> you know. She's, well, what we don't know is that she's simultaneously auditioning for the next Saw movie. Right. And so <laughs> <laughs> that, that whisper was really her audition. Um, no, I, she and the president uh, have this strange relationship because even back in, in 2013, I think it was, when the Ferguson riots were happening, uh, and Trump went after President Obama, uh, she decided to go after Trump at that time, saying, uh, you know, lay off the president. And, the, and that was a very public thing. I think everything Omarosa does is for the public con consumption. She, she's a public figure and she wants to be. Her husband died and she made that a public thing, right? I think everything she does is, is to elicit some sort of response and she's doing it really well. She's been doing it for more than, you know, a decade and she's doing it really well. Maybe what it is that I want, like I want somebody to be in charge of like standing up about once a week and saying, you know, like Rob Porter and Rob Kardashian are not the same thing, right? <laughs> they don't have the same moral status, you know? One of them is this kind of tricked up fake celebrity. That's Rob Kardashian, by the way. Just to be clear. <laughs> I was like, which one? Which one is this? <laughs> and the other one is this person who had security clearance, or you know, who had no security clearance and was reading high-value documents, and he couldn't get security clearance because he hit women for for real in the real White House, which is. I don't know, m m Tom, maybe I'm exaggerating the tenuous hold people have on reality right now. Well, I, I <laughs> maybe a little bit, but I also think we <laughs> should recognize that, one, on this show, we're talking about you know the uh, kind of visual representation of two leading political figures in the Obamas, and then the kind of pop culture, uh, somewhat trashy television representation of another black woman who was, uh, you know, as, as you said, quite high up in the White House uh, under a very different administration. And I think that you know, what these two different uh, kind of points of access of, um, of black people in political power in the United States and their kind of cultural representation is really fascinating. It's, it's you know, if the Obama portraits are ones of kind of thought-provoking and impeccable taste uh, and meant to be, you know, somewhat controversial. The Omarosa, uh, that whisper clip is meant to go down uh, as easy as anything <laughs> and is meant to elicit, you know, the uh, kind of most visceral of gut reactions of sympathy and fear uh, and, and then anger and then who knows, revolution next, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, that's a good place to end. I don't know, other than just as Mercy shared a little uh, clip with us. I, do we have time? Should we play the clip? I don't think we need to. Uh, but this is apparently how we are going to be observing Black History Month. Um, <laughs> I mean, we did it well with the Obama portraits, I think, and now we just talked about Omarosa for 10 minutes. <laughs> um, so happy Black History Month. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Cloverfield Paradox. That's right. We're going to take a little break. We're going to come back. <laughs> if you think that we couldn't go lower than we've been so far, <laughs> you are so wrong. All right. Live from Gateway. Con Garnet, get him going. <laughs> Live from Gateway. It's the nose. <laughs> Thank you.
And we are back. This is the news. We're doing it on a Wednesday. We're doing it live in front of a live audience here at the wonderful Gateway Community College here in New Haven, Connecticut. I know that's all very confusing. We're as disoriented as you are, except that we're more disoriented because all of us have watched the Cloverfield Paradox, and you probably have it. So, I mean, I will just quickly try to set this up, and then, Pedro, you can start auditioning for your, oh your new show on <laughs> Lucy and Tom's and Mercy's station. Um, but so the Cloverfield Paradox is the third uh, in a series of loosely interlocked, or maybe not so loosely interlocked, it's one of the big questions that looms <coughs> here, uh, interlocked movies. They all uh, fall under the imprimatur, anyway, of J.J. Abrams, uh, one of the big... Uh, sort of master auteurs of sci-fi stuff these days. Um, the first two of them were made for $25 million or less, uh, and then went on to domestically gross like $80 million. So there's nothing that Hollywood doesn't like about something <laughs> like that. The first one was sort of a found footage Brooklyn hipster uh, monster movie where you know something's eating the entire island of Manhattan. Uh, and the second one was a little bit more of a trapped in a bunker uh, kind of thing. Uh, and this one uh, takes us out into space where uh, uh, the Earth, I, you know, this, I want to say one thing about this movie. When you describe the plot of this movie, you just sound like an idiot. I don't care. <laughs> well, you made the mistake of starting from the beginning of the Cloverfield yeah, franchise. Yeah, yeah. I don't care if That's you're Stephen Hawking. You're just going to sound like an idiot talking about this movie. So I, I just want to get that on the record right now. But anyway, the Earth is running out of energy, and there's they put a particle accelerator up in space to get some energy, and then... All hell breaks loose. I don't know, Pedro, this is your audition. <laughs> if you can successfully explain yes. or even help people know how to think about the Cloverfield Paradox, uh, I can guarantee you a job. Oh, dear. <laughs> this is, that was, I mean, you've already got a like job. You have a like, yeah. I can no, exactly. I mean, yeah, I can guarantee you a non-paying job. <laughs> right. I mean, it's, it's you, the thing with movies like this is that it is like a, it's a, it is a space station horror movie, and there's been a bunch of those. Um, it's that try to tie it into like a larger world building of this kind of Cloverfield universe, which apparently is trying to be formed, uh, in which that it's not just that, it actually ties into two other movies, which, you know, you didn't think were related, but surprise, they are. And, um, you know, I think that that's, they, they really tried to take a movie which, uh, probably would have been a pretty blah, uh, you know, sci-fi channel movie. And they said, wait a second, we can make this a Cloverfield movie and it'll make it instantly kind of more important and, and a bigger deal. And that's kind of what I think they tried to do. But you can see the reason that it debuted suddenly on Netflix, you know, with a surprise Super Bowl uh, release with no, uh, uh, no uh, reviews or no previews or anything beforehand kind of shows you the level of movie they ended up with. Right, they, so they actually bought Super Bowl commercial time and with and then drop this mm -hmm. thing on the net onto Netflix with no warning. The theory, I think, being the less you know, the better. Um, but uh, let's hear a little bit of the magic of this movie. Uh, so, Gene, I think we do want to play. I'm going to go against Jonathan's advice. We're going to play a <laughs> B1 just to give you kind of a little sense of what the movie sounds like, anyway. You okay? Yeah. It's the rest of the world I'm worried about. I mean, you see the same news that I do. It's madness. Oil wars are spreading. Russia's threatening ground invasion now. Can you believe that? Ground invasion. We shall only waste all their oil reserves. Anyway, normal life is hanging by a thread. You? We're all on edge. And we only have enough fuel for three more firings. I remember. If this doesn't work. I can't even think about what happens down there. I don't think any of us are feeling hopeful. All right, so obviously a movie for the Trump years. Um, <laughs> and uh, you're hearing, I always say her name incorrectly, um, but you're hearing uh, the voices uh, of Roger Davies as Michael and Gugu Mbatha Raw, who's just a terrific actress, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, as Hamilton, who is sort of probably the personal fulcrum through which we see an, an awful lot of this movie. Um, I don't know. So, um, Mercy, <laughs> uh, Mercy, I get the feeling that you, like me, were even unsure about what you could possibly 
say about this particular movie? Oh, uh, I'm sorry that I've given you that <laughs> feeling because I love this movie. <laughs> love oh, oh, I'm so happy. <laughs> yeah, no, I love this movie. A lot of people don't know this about me, but I really enjoy movies about space. And this movie <laughs> is effectively War of the Worlds meets uh, Interstellar or meets Mars, right? And um, Neil deGrasse Tyson has this thing that he says, every movie about space is humans go into space and something gets goes wrong, right? <laughs> that is the plot of every movie about space. Um, and the twist here is that the something that goes wrong is that they went into another dimension and I haven't seen that in a space movie yet. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoyed <laughs> it. I really enjoyed it. And there's sort of like a, we talked about Sneaky P on the show once, <laughs> you don't know who to trust. There's a little bit of that element in this mm -hmm. movie. You don't know who is a friend or a foe. And I really enjoyed it. I'm, first of all, I'm really glad that, we, <laughs> that you did. And Tom, like you sort of started to enjoy it and then you kind of pulled the ripcord. Well, I've, I've been <laughs> encouraged by Mercy's enthusiasm. Right. So I'm going to embrace <laughs> yes. this movie as well. I'm, I'm gonna give three very quick kind of hot takes on this movie. And one, the, the first one I from my most cynical perspective is, uh, yeah, this movie makes absolutely no <laughs> sense, right? No. Uh, it has, you know, this kind of essentialized characters who are reduced to these little flags on, on their, their shoulders. Right. If, if anyone is, you know, if anyone loves the Olympics for like the national, uh, kind of nationalist fury that it foments, then this movie may be for you because you have have uh, kind of uh, Russians pitted against Americans, pitted against Irish, pitted against uh, a few other nationalities who just seem to hate each other because of the flags on their shoulders. Uh, yeah, this this movie uh, is not you know of the same craftsmanship as something like Ridley Scott's Alien, uh, I would say, or Christopher <laughs> Nolan's Interstellar, or Tarkovsky's Solaris. Not in that that great you know canon of sci-fi space movies. But I do think what this movie does really well uh, and really enjoyably is that. It is a haunted house movie in space. Uh, it is a movie where we know just enough about a small group of characters uh, to, even if we, we don't care tremendously for them, where we understand that the loss of a character uh, is something that is going to impact the, the story and the audience in some kind of meaningful way. But this, this surpri the surprises and the uh, kind of indelible images that this movie manages to produce enough uh, kept me at the edge of my couch or wherever one watches uh, a Netflix movie. Uh, you know, transfixed by, I was, I was most reminded by the kind of great Vincent Price uh, 1959 uh, house on Haunted Hill, which this movie, you know, pales in comparison to in terms of quality and has no impresario like Vincent Price is there. But at least we have, you know, around every corner uh, the potential of an image that is just really going to shake you and entertain you to your core. And I, I really appreciate that about it. Cloverfield. I, I do want to say something about kind of the business background to this. I was mentioning before that those first two Cloverfield movies, and the first Cloverfield movie is really great, by the yes. way. It's just so yeah. good. Uh, oh, Pedro's like, he's like, oh, I don't know. Might, might have a problem down there. No, I loved it. You like, you like it too. Yeah, right? I love that movie, one. and I think a pretty <coughs> good case could be made for 10 Cloverfield Lane, too. Anyway, they were made for like peanuts by Hollywood standards and then made quite a bit of mo mo money. This one around was in Paramount Mount's feature film division, or at least sort of the cheaper version of their feature film uh, division. Somehow or other, it wound up costing a lot more money. And then the new head of Paramount looked at it and said, ah. Eh, like releasing this to theaters doesn't really feel like a great idea. J.J. Abrams had said that he would come in and kind of tweak this thing, but as Pedro can explain to you, J.J. Abrams is going to be a little bit busier now with the next Star Wars installment than he <laughs> originally had planned to be. And so they, uh, the, the head of Paramount is a genius. He managed to sell this thing to Netflix for I think roughly what it cost to make in the first place. Uh, and But Pedro, it does bring up questions of distribution, right? Like our expectations are different sitting in wherever it is that Tom says that he sits watching <laughs> something that didn't cost him anything to put on his screen, right? No, that's true. And, and, and Netflix also famously does not um, reveal uh, viewership numbers. So you don't even know what, what will this will end up being. We'll never know any, any metric other than it is on Netflix. Um, for this movie, and it's probably for the best on this one. Um, but I think that it is an interesting, it, had this come out in, in the theaters, I think it would have been just uh, just a bomb, and, and then it would have been a Cloverfield bomb, and that might have kind of killed the franchise or anything. There is a fourth one in the works that we know. It's, oh, God, I'm so excited. Yeah, it's supposed to take place <laughs> in, it's World like set in World War II. Or it's set yeah. in World War II. It's, its working title is Overlord. Um, <laughs> so, well, you know, so Tom, 
um, now that you've, you're, you've rekindled your enthusiasm <laughs> for this, let me say that I think the other way in which this particular movie fails is that, okay, so there are these two, first two movies that have some kind of nominal linkage, which I couldn't really talk, talk very much about without spoiling the ending of the second one a little bit, but no really clear linkage. And I think what this movie purports to do is to explain how all three, uh, provide mm -hmm. a map like a little Tolkien map that you can run your finger along to say, okay, so here's how you get from this movie to that movie and then down to this movie and maybe how we're gonna get to World War II ultimately. And I don't think it does that. I'm like more confused than ever. Yeah, I, I hate, uh, I'm, I'm sorry to disappoint, but I agree with you. I, if, <laughs> if you're looking for any kind of uh, larger kind of narrative explanation for what's happening in the first two, I think that this movie uh, will be quite the disappointment. But where I do see, and I also, I should say that 10 Cloverfield Lane, I, I think I may like even more than the first one, and in particular in its surprising commitment to the alien invasion story at the end of the movie. I won't yep. give well, away uh, okay. too many more details than that, but it's a movie that for the majority of its runtime could very much be this small kind of chamber drama just racked up with, with suspense and paranoia uh, that could be about nothing other than the three people trapped in this bunker. But instead, uh, what we see is that, you know, we, we have our cake and eat it too. We can see that there is insanity in this bunker and there actually is a threat outside of it. I don't think that the Cloverfield Paradox uh, manages to accomplish anything quite as complex as that. But I do think that it is an interesting continuation of what all of the Cloverfield movies uh, have done, which is experiment with point of view and perspective. As you said, the first one, uh, the original Cloverfield, w had this found footage feel to it, and it's told, you know, un not you know, unlike many movies that we see from the first person, just a man running around Manhattan with his video c camera, trying to understand the chaos uh, that is uh, kind of surrounding him as the city collapses. The second one, although told maybe in the third person, is very much rooted in the head of the main character, played by Mary Elizabeth Winstead. We know as little or as much as she knows. And as we are, you know, as narrative points are revealed to her, uh, you know, we are as surprised and, and delighted here. I think we are, you know, we're nominally with the Gugu and Beth of Ra character, but I think where this movie takes the experimentation with perspective is that up in space, we are suddenly divided into two. And this is kind of, I don't want to make too many comparisons between this and Solaris, but Solaris did something similar, where Solaris, you know, threw this kind of grieving psychologist up into space and said, here you will be presented with images of the loved ones whom you've lost. Uh, and try to hold on to your sanity as you as you watch you know, these people who are no longer in your life walk around the spaceship. This movie does something somewhat similar in that it offers the main character the opportunity to throw away everything that she knows about her own reality in order to pursue pursue a uh, phantasm. And even you know it may not be perfectly executed, but I think it's a really interesting idea. Um, for people who want to try to understand the movie, one of the nice things that they do is uh, have a clip where somebody tries to explain the movie. I mean, they have a scene where we have a clip where somebody tries to do that. This uh, a scene where you see an author on TV, the proverbial author on TV, uh, trying to explain what the Cloverfield Paradox uh, is. So Gene, if we could just play B2 here. Right this minute, they're testing a particle accelerator up there so we can learn how to make unlimited energy down here. But those who have accepted the Cloverfield Paradox is real, no matter how dangerous that is. Because that accelerator is a thousand times more powerful than any ever built. Every time they test it, they risk ripping open the membrane of space-time, smashing together multiple dimensions, shattering reality, and not just on that station, everywhere. This experiment could unleash chaos, the likes of which we have never seen. Monsters, demons, beasts from the sea. To clarify, you believe their efforts to solve the energy crisis might unleash demons. Yeah. Oh yeah. And not just here and now. In the past, in the future, in other dimensions. You have no idea how much I would love to be wrong about this. Monk. If you want to know more, turn that please, off. Please, read my book. <laughs> <laughs> Was that someone on the panel yeah, saying that's yeah. actually, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> I just have to think that the people who work at the Large Hadron Super Collider, you know, when they watch that clip, they're going, well, no, we have enough problems right now with what people think could happen. Because they certainly aren't going, yeah, no, like 95% chance there won't be demons, you know, I mean... And this movie was, the working title for this movie was The God Particle. The God Particle, what, yeah. You know, so it... Uh, so, I don't know, I mean, Mercy, maybe as we get ready to end here, this is way more discussion than the Cloverfield Paradox, in my opinion, warrants. Um, but, but
But maybe there is something to be said for. I mean, one thing people say a lot on social media about this is, well, I didn't have to leave the house. Which, yeah. of course, is the entire premise of 10 Cloverfield Lane. But anyway, continue. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah, absolutely. I think that the, uh, the dimension I want to live in is the dimension where all movies go straight to Netflix. Right? Like, <laughs> that was the major takeaway from this movie for me. <laughs> um, I, I just, I didn't have to leave the house. Uh, I will admit that I did a little bit of a, a movie marathon. I, I rewatched Clo uh, the first Cloverfield, then mm -hmm. 10 Cloverfield Lane, um, which was probably not great for you know, how critical I was going to be for uh, the Cloverfield Paradox, but it did set me up to, uh, I guess, try to sh string together a common theme. I still don't understand how the air is contaminated. I don't understand that. That doesn't make any sense to me. But I, I think my major takeaway is still, you know, a, a, a horror movie about space, number one. Number two is, if we thought that this entire panel wasn't a celebration of Black History Month, mm -hmm. I do want to say a horror movie about space where uh, the first person to die is not a black person is a celebration <laughs> of, <laughs> of Black true. History Month. And uh, that has made major and black characters. And right. the main characters yeah. uh, are black. Um, and then my third takeaway is just, yeah, I didn't have to leave the house, and I want to be in that dimension. Yeah, you're better off not leaving the house, as it turns out. All right, <laughs> we're going to take a little break here. We're going to come back. We're going to make some recommendations to you, and other stuff is going to happen. So we are, get them going, Garnet, live from <laughs> Gateway Community College, <laughs> talking about bad culture. So this is a special treat for you. This has never happened before. Um, we often do shows on the road like this one, but we usually don't have Kyone Wolf with us but because she's back in the studio running the board. Today she's here and she's going to do what we think of as the credits. Take it away, Kyone Wolf. Today's show was produced by Jonathan McPants, Betsy Kaplan, and Josh Nalea, with help from the big kids, Katie Talarski and Jean Amatruda. Our intern is Garnet McLaughlin. Big thanks to Gateway Community College. The part of Bill Curry was played by John Goodman. On tomorrow's show, a syphilistic look at the history of hygiene. And now, back to Colin. Right. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, Guyon Wolf. Yes. Yay. Yes. <laughs> Woo! In almost nine years, she has never done those credits live, uh, and she's never done them in front of an audience. So your Maybe. broadcast history in a very small <laughs> way is being made here, and you're watching. Uh, all right, so what we do at the end of the news is we make recommendations. Uh, so I'll just, we'll just kind of go down the line and do that. So Tom Breen, uh, what do you have to recommend? Okay, I, I have two quick ones, and they're personal ones as well. So um, I, for the past eight years, I have been working in some capacity at Yale Press, which is a book publisher here in town. And starting on March 1st, I'm going to be moving over full time to uh, the New Haven Independent, a pretty stellar uh, local, kind of hyper local community news outlet run by Paul Bass, who was on these air, air, airwaves earlier today. Uh, so I just, I want to, my first is just give a big shout out to all of the fantastic people at Yale Press. Uh, they publish uh, hundreds of books a year in art history, history, uh, politi political science, philosophy. Uh, the way that they are able to straddle the kind of academic and trade line and produce some really um, um, incredible books I, I've been very grateful to be a part of. And If you were going to so, recommend so one you. book recently published by Yale Press for people around. Well, definitely my, my favorite, this is not a recent one, but my favorite book that Yale Press has published is called City Urbanism and Its End, which is from oh, about okay. a decade and a half ago by a Yale professor named Doug Ray, mm -hmm. that if anyone is interested in both the history of New Haven uh, as well as the history of urban renewal and how New Haven figures so prominently in that story. That is the definitive tale of it. Um, but uh, most recently, uh, the Michael Walzer um, has a book on the foreign policy for the left uh, that I think is, is pretty fantastic. But really, any, anything that Yale Press puts out um, is great. And the second one, um, it being Valentine's Day, she's going to hate it, but I'm going to call it out. I want to say uh, thank you to Lucy, who Aww. is just the best uh, partner I could hope for. And also this runs Lucy a, Gilman. When Lucy you're on Gilman, WNPR, you a phenomenal, um, <laughs> it's not just uh, a uh, a stellar reporter here in town and editor, but she has turned around the New Haven Arts paper from uh, an outlet that was a bit of a, a member's newsletter into something that is a truly kind of critical and responsible to the community arts uh, kind of venue for arts criticism. It, just go to artspaper.org to find everything from interviews with the next director of the New Haven Symphony Orchestra to what's happening at the Armory on, on Goff Street. It's, uh, it's really a phenomenal job that Lucy's doing, so kudos to Lucy. All right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
I just I just want to group hug the two of you. <laughs> um, so I know that you guys hate uh, plugs, but I'm going to plug uh, Work It Out. Uh, work It Out on uh, <laughs> WNHH. Um, streams live on Mondays at noon, and you can catch it on uh, the, the New Haven Independence uh, Facebook page. It is the show about what people do for work, at work, and what mo motivates them to move. Um, and then my uh, recommendation, my endorsement based off of Cloverfield is uh, Andy Weir's new book, Artemis. Um, it is currently out on Audible, and the Audible is read by Rosario Dawson, and she does a, f a fantastic job. Um, the book, it, Andy Weir, if you are unaware, is the author of uh, The Martian, um, which you might be familiar with, the movie adaptation. Uh, it's a great book. Uh, it is placed, it is based on um, a tourist town on the moon and just the same as every uh, movie in space people go into space and something bad happens so <laughs> well it's also it. it's it's <laughs> it's noir fiction in a lot of ways exactly yeah and, and it's i also i happen to have experienced the rosario dawson version of it she's incredible i mean she's there's really about great. 19 accents you have to do because this is a very blended town it's sort of like key west it's one yeah, of those places absolutely. where people kind of turn up at the end of the line uh and so everybody has a different accent and she's like amazingly good at this and the lawman is like a canadian uh, guy from canada who's just like this this uh officer that like everyone entrusts <laughs> and she does a great job just narrating the book. I will say if you are not technically inclined you will probably not enjoy this book because there's a lot of technology that's being explained all the time most of which I didn't understand. He does it specifically because he feels as though it needs to be accurate just mm -hmm. in case Neil deGrasse Tyson is reading the book. <laughs> right. <laughs> So Pedro, what have you got for us? So actually also based on the Cloverfield paradox, um, there weren't, there were uh, some good things in the movie. Um, number one was actually the soundtrack, which is composed by Bear McCrary. Uh, so, you know, if anyone wants to just listen to any Bear McCrary soundtracks, uh, he did Battlestar Galactica and he did a few other shows. They're all fantastic. Uh, and so, uh, but the big, the big thing, I think my, my favorite part of Cloverfield paradox was actually Chris O'Dowd um, who's a comedian uh, normally. He plays comic roles. Uh, he's in Bridesmaids. Uh, and obviously his probably most well-known role is in the IT crowd. Uh, so either one of those shows you should watch. And this is kind of a dad, uh, a dad endorsement. Chris O'Dowd is also the narrator on the Netflix cartoon uh, Puff and Rock. And um, if you have a child and you watch it, you will end up watching it and enjoying it way more than you think you will because he, um, you know, he, he just deadpans the entire thing and he narrates it kind of knowing that he's talking to the parents and not the kids. So, uh, the, so Chris O'Dowd is my, uh, my big endorsement. All right. I don't have too many good bridges from Cloverfield to anything, although I've always thought that my theory, my theory about Cloverfield the monster is <laughs> that the reason he is the way he is is because other monster kids tormented him about his name. Kind of like, <laughs> Cloverfield, <laughs> Cloverfield. You know, he just became very bitter and sour as a result of all that. Uh, I would point out that we ourselves are in two different dimensions today. On the one hand, it is Ash Wednesday, a time of feasting uh, and self-abnegation. It's also Valentine's Day when people eat chocolates and uh, drink champagne. So work that out anyway. It's also the first day of spring training for pitchers and catchers. So it's, we're at like <laughs> multiple levels here. I will first of all say that last night I saw at the Yale Rep uh, the f uh, field guide, which is a really remarkable production. It's only got a few days left and it was kind of packed there last night. I don't think you know if you can get tickets. It's by this group from Austin, the Rude Mechs, as in Rude Mechanicals. Uh, it is a deconstruction of the Brothers Karamazov with I mean, among other things, like at one point this very depressed bear, I mean, like a, like a bear comes out and with a microphone and does some stand-up comedy, like really depressed stand-up comedy. <laughs> um, it's stuff like that. So it's, it challenges you, but uh, probably in a pretty good way. Also, something good that I'm watching on Netflix is Rectify. I, I gave it a shot the first time around and didn't like it that much. I'm back with it. It's, a, it's got like four seasons. I'm about halfway into the second season. and It's sort of sin and redemption and some really interesting mysticism things and I don't know I, it's maybe worth your time I know what's been worth my time is to visit with these wonderful people up here on stage Pedro Soto Mercy Quay Tom Breen it's been an excellent edition of the nose the first one ever on a Wednesday thanks for coming and I think we have to go thanks to all of you get them clapping Garnet thank you Gateway College Vernon I already said that one Avon 
Farmington. Yeah, 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 yeah.